Hi everyone, it's Christina Gerges. How are you? I am happy to welcome you to our sixth journal club uh, tonight and uh, we will be in the company of Dr. Elise Rosenberg and I'm just waiting for her to, I'm going to just add her right now actually because I think she's watching. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to have her join us and I think she's excited as well. Um, all right, it says connecting, so we're almost there. Oh, hi. Hey, good evening. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you can doing? You, good, you can hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Um, well, it's, uh, it's almost 7.30. We have a couple of people watching, so I think we're ready to go. Um, and so I uh, wanted to get you guys started with Dr. Rosenberg's um, her uh, bio and just let you know a little bit about her so that you can um, be ex as excited as I am about her expertise. So as I said, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Rosenberg. She completed her psychiatry residency in 2010 at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. She started working at Arizona Children's uh, Association August of 2018 doing telepsychiatry in a community mental health center for children and youth in Arizona. She's resided in Seattle for the last four years. She's previously worked in community mental health centers with adults and children, and she's also worked in school settings, family court, and community-based programs. She's done research um, on geriatric bipolar disorder in the past, and she loves developing long-term therapeutic relationships with her patients and seeing them through challenging and stable times. She enjoys advocating for her patients to accomplish their, goal, their uh, goals. And Dr. Rosenberg has been with uh, Psychiatry Network since September of 2018, so one of our newer members. Um, she enjoys collaborating with providers nationwide and sharing resources and hearing thoughts on challenging cases. So thank you again for uh, volunteering to help out with our journal club project and um, welcome everyone. If you guys have any questions um, while Dr. Rosenberg's presenting, um, just post them as a comment. I will keep track of them and ask her at the end. Um, our presentation is going to be about 15 minutes. I put directions for the CME um, at the top of the post and uh, if you guys have any issues, I think we've worked out all the kinks at this point, but if you guys do have any issues, just let me know and I'm happy to help. So take it away, Dr. Rosenberg. Great. Thank you so much, Christina, um, for the introduction and uh, all your hard work on the Psychiatry Network and the Journal Club. Um, so a big thank you to Christina and Rebecca. Um, oh, thanks sure. for all your hard work. Yeah. So um, I, it's a little bit of a hard act to follow with Eric. <laughs> He's done such a great job on the psychoses, but I will kind of dovetail on to his comments. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the article is Improving Outcomes of First Episode Psychosis, and it's an overview. Uh, this article was put out by uh, Dr. Fasor Pali, uh, McGorry, and Kane. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the names, if anyone has oh. a <laughs> better pronunciation. That's okay. That yeah. Um, so they're out of London and Australia and New York, uh, coincidentally. And so this article... Um, was a, a definitely an interesting article, um, kind of um, on that same theme of first episode psychoses. Um, this is an important topic for us uh, because psychotic disorders has a pretty high prevalence. Um, the prevalence in 2013 was 23.6 million prevalent cases. Um, so this is a high um, population. And um, we, you'll, uh, you know, we certainly run into patients with psychoses and schizophrenia. Um, and so um, I'm starting with the introduction. Um, this is a, a good introduction to read. It kind of talks about why um, this is an interesting topic to think about and to um, research. Uh, so it says one in two people living with schizophrenia actually does not receive care for the condition, um, which is also interesting. Um, and the recovery rate, which is one in seven, um, is associated with a quite high level of disability. It's the 11th leading cause of disability worldwide in 2013. Um, and, um, and that's following a first episode of psychoses. 
Um, and sadly, it has um, not improved over the past 70 years under uh, routine clinical care. Um, so um, as well, this is a pretty high cost for um, uh, national cost wise. Um, schizophrenia um, in the population um, range from, let's see, it was um, 102 billion worldwide um, that was used um, towards people with schizophrenia and their needs. Um, furthermore, the risk of all-cause all mortality for psychotic disorder is twice uh, the risk for the general population. So um, this is definitely a population that we can do better with and um, need to improve kind of outcomes. So the way that they proposed that or the research that they did, and I'm sorry, this article pu was published in World Psychiatry in uh, 2017, um, in October, so a pretty recent article. What they propose, um, a very um, helpful thing to look through when you look through this article is table one. Um, this is really kind of the meat and the overview of the entire article. And what is presented in table one is the revised clinical staging model for psychotic disorders um, and interventions for improving the outcomes of first episode psychoses. So what they propose is a staging system for psychoses. Um, and it's divided into um, different stages, which I'll review now. So the first stage is stage zero. Um, and that's asymptomatic um, patients who have genetic risk um, that is present um, in the pre-morbid stage. Then we have stage one. Um, these are patients with negative and cognitive symptoms and attenuated um, psychotic symptoms and short-lived remitting psychotic episodes in individuals with high risk of psychoses. For stage one, they subdivide it uh, by stage 1A, 1B, 1C, um, and the definition I gave incorporates all of those. The next stage is stage two, um, and this is full threshold uh, first episode psychosis um, and is present who, um, in persons who experience early and full recovery. Then um, the last stage that they discuss is stage three. Um, and they also have um, subdivisions of that. And that's a single relapse of psychotic disorders, multiple relapses, and incomplete recovery from the first episode in groups that experience late and or incomplete recovery from symptoms. Um, and finally, severe persisting or unremitting illness in individuals who present with chronic symptoms. Um, so the, the meat of the article is a staging system that they propose. Um, and then we'll further go on now to talk about um, the research and kind of the interventions they've, that they've talked about in the different stages. Um, but a good takeaway point is that table one there. So the first stage, the stage zero, um, these are the asymptomatic patients at genetic risk um, that present in the pre-morbid stage. Um, the authors um, talk about um, inter, uh, tri nine trials that they've studied with this that aim at primary prevention of psychoses. Um, so asymptomatic risk stages um, pose challenge in these research terms as um, no pathophysiological mechanism has been validated um, in the development of psychoses. Um, and therefore existing trials are based on a number of hypotheses. So the um, tables to review for this stage zero, I'm just gonna open that table right now, is table two, if you look at that, that talks about candidates for universal intervention per primary prevention of psychoses. So again, kind of these stage zero or even kind of they define primary prevention as a universal um, prevention. So um, they give us the definition for that on page 251. And that is um, primary prevention aims to reduce the incidence of symptoms and ultimately of mental disorders. Um, and the three categories of primary prevention are universal prevention, um, selective prevention, and um, then indicated prevention. So in table one, they talk about the primary prevention, excuse me, I'm sorry, table two, they talk about uh, primary prevention. Um, and so I think they say that 
meaning it's these um, interventions are still under research. So there wasn't that much positive data or that much negative data. They focus primarily on the first intervention, which is perinatal phosphatidylcholine in pregnant women. Um, and then if you go through the other interventions, they're mostly, uh, that's what they talked about in the article, the phosphatidylcholine, but the other ones they talk about are school-based interventions, um, and then fetal and neonatal and acetylcholine, uh, then uh, polysaturated fatty acids, uh, vitamin A, D, and B, and folic acid, uh, prebiotics, uh, and school-based intervention, and exercise training. So um, I think um, it's interesting to learn about that, but there wasn't much definitive kind of recommendations on that. So that's table two. That's another thing to look, a uh, good thing to look through. Um, then we move on. Oh, and then also, I'm sorry, in stage zero, it also talks about modifications in table three. Um, and in there, they outline environmental and social risk that may increase the risk of psychoses. Um, in asymptomatic individuals. Um, and it talks about um, different type of um, environmental risk factors. And let me just open that table. Okay, so table three talks about parental risk factors, uh, like parental psychoses, parental affective disorder, um, older paternal age. Um, it talks about perinatal risk factors, um, such as complications of pregnancy, abnormal fetal growth and development, complications of delivery, gestational influence, uh, season of birth, um, and then it talks about social risk factors, ethnic minority, um, infection, traumatic brain injury, vitamin D deficiency, daily tobacco use. It talks about cannabis use, childhood trauma, adult life events, and pre-morbid IQ. Um, so those are uh, talked about in table three. Um, and so, right, it talks about the traumatic experience, uh, being a first or second, second generation migrant, uh, complications in pregnancy. Um, however, they also state um, that there are currently no recognized interventions that would reduce the risk of developing psychoses um, in this stage zero group. And um, basically in stage zero, what they advocate for is universal improvement in mental health literacy for this at-risk population. So um, then they move on to stage one. Um, and I will define again, stage one is where someone has negative and cognitive symptoms and attenuated psychotic symptoms. Um, and short-lived remitting psychotic episodes. Um, and again, you these are stage uh, one, but they subdivide them as well, like A, B, and C. Um, and how they define this group, um, they call them the clinically high risk of psychosis, or the CHRP. Um, so in terms of efficacy, the CHRP services um, appear to improve engagement and trust and satisfaction with services. Um, individuals within the CHRP services also have a shorter duration of untreated psychosis as compared to the population that present to services when already experiencing a first episode. So the preventive effect of intervention is not sustained though, sadly, after 24 months of follow-up. And um, they review this a bit, let's see in table four, if you scroll down a bit. Um, and um, let's see. So table four is randomized controlled trials of the effectiveness of specialized integrated um, early intervention services um, for first episode psychoses. Um, sorry, those are actually for stage two. Um, there is not a, there's not a chart for stage one, um, but they discuss it like within the context of the article. Um, and this is an important population stage one to think about because um, a lot of these stage one patients will uh, progress on to developing like full um, psychosis within a two year period. And that's about 20% of this population stage one develop um, psychosis within the next two years. 
Um, so it's a good population um, to monitor and think about. Um, and they also talk about um, online tools um, to stratify these patients. Let me just find that website that they mentioned. Um, so they looked at a website. It was called www.psychosis-risk.net. And this is on page uh, 255. Um, and it discusses the website. Um, okay, so thus it seems critical to optimize the proportion of individuals at risk of developing psychoses who are referred to these CHRP services. Um, so individualized risk um, estimation e-tools that are based on easily collectible variables have recently been developed. And the psychosis risk net is one that they refer to. Um, they also refer to another website, uh, which is www.headspace.org.au. Um, so that's an Australian website, um, but that also may be useful. It talks about sequential testing um, is in line with clinical staging models and can further be enhanced by frontline primary care youth mental health models developed in facilities where the access of young people from the school and the community. So that's another website that may be helpful to reference. Um, okay, I should, I'm probably running low on time. So I'm gonna move on to stage two. Um, so the authors talk about um, a number of studies detailing some results in favor of what they recommend as early intervention teams, uh, which showed a greater treatment response after 24 months as compared to treatment as usual and also in favor of family interventions in reducing family burden and severity of symptoms. Uh, the authors present a table with the 12 studies um, and the duration was um, anywhere from nine to 144 months of follow-up and provides meta-analytical results of relapse prevention um, in, services, uh, in service users under the care of early intervention services. Um, a review of evidence suggests that there is no statistically significant difference in terms of relapse ratio between service users under the early intervention services compared to standard care. Um, so Fusar Poli et al. suggests that more research is needed into pre preventing the risk of relapse following first episode of psychosis, as it subsequently wraps may significant <laughs> may impact significantly on social functioning and other long-term outcomes. Um, this section um, talks about, this is in stage uh, two, it talks about the use of long-acting injectables versus oral treatment in preventing relapse. However, it was inconclusive. Um, they talked about seven meta-analysis showing no evidence for the use of long-acting injectables in preventing relapse and one meta-analysis that showed contrary results. Um, so um, I know I'm running low on time. Should I skip forward or what? <clears throat> um, no, I mean, whatever you think is important for people to know about this article. So I feel like already we've learned a lot. At least I've learned a lot. So okay. yeah, whatever you think is important. Okay, um, I'll skip forward to stage three. Um, and so that was stage two, talking about the long actable injectable. Stage three, the authors suggest actually that approximately 30% of service users with first episode psychosis, psychosis show minimal response to antipsychotics treatment. Um, and therefore argue that recognizing treatment resistance early may result in earlier treatment with clozapine. So that kind of dovetails onto Eric's article with clozapine and really encourages the early use or early um, uh, providers of clozapine because we will always have this 30% population that will remain re kind of refractory. Um, so um, in addition, Sara Poli et al. argue that there is limited evidence to support disease progression to stage three chronic presentation but at the same time suggests time to recovery from subsequent epi episodes are longer and doses of antipsychotic medications are higher. Um, so basically uh, in a conclusion, um, it, it says that we show that to improve outcomes of a complex heterogeneous 
syndrome, such as psychoses, it is necessary to globally adopt complex models, integrating a clinical staging framework, coordinated specialty care programs that offer preemptive intervention to high risk groups identified across the early stages of the disorder. Um, and then some of my take home points is that, you know, this is a very prevalent disease, about 23.6 million people. So it's something important to think about. And then um, overall, even within that population, the clinical stage one, about 20% of those patients will go on to develop fulminant psychoses. And then something to think about with those more stage three is that, um, let's see, that about 30% um, of patients with first episode psychosis have that minimal, minimal response to antipsychotics. So let's think about getting clozapine early for these patients. Those were well, my thoughts. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I actually, I'm like, that was a good refresher for me. Some of those um, risk factors, especially some of the prenatal risk factors, I wasn't completely aware of. Um, a couple of them I think I've never really knew of. Um, and that information about the long-acting injectables was kind of new to me. I just always assumed that long-acting injectables would be better at preventing relapse because of, um, I guess, perceived improved and compliance, but it doesn't sound like that's necessarily the case. So good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, and so if I was reviewing the article, I think I, if for, um, if you haven't read the article yet, what I would say is the biggest take home point is table one. It really summarizes the entire, entire article in a nice, concise table and defines for you stage zero, stage one, stage two, what those definitions are and what those interventions are. Okay, well, that is great. Thank you. Um, yeah, this was definitely a, one of our longer articles. So thank you for doing such a nice, um, easy to understand summary. And um, if there's no other questions, you guys, I mean, if there are questions, please feel free um, to put that in. And uh, we'll try to answer them after the fact. But otherwise, we'll see you next time. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. Right. Sure. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.